Cool. And I just want to start this by telling you that this is a, a day we've been looking forward to. <laughs> we've been working very hard on uh, bringing this exhibit uh, to the UW well before I even joined this chapter of BFP. Um, <clears throat> it was sidelined by the epidemic um, a couple of years ago and was kind of in storage and then made its way to other universities um, in San Diego, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, we're just lucky that we finally get to have it here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, if you have not seen the exhibit, it is in the Allen Library, um, the entrance to Suazalo. It's a really great exhibit and it will be up until the end of this month, um, Friday, October 28th. I will start by saying um, Thank you for coming today, and um, I, I hope we have a very successful and productive day. I'm going to introduce our speakers um, who've really kicked this whole thing off and made this possible uh, with their energy and devotion to, to making this exhibit happen. Um, our opening remarks today will be from Christoph Giebel and Randy Rowland. Uh, Christoph is uh, the Associate Professor of International Studies and History, Jackson School of International Studies at UW here. Um, his research and teaching interests concern 20th century Vietnam, comparative colonialisms, both French and United States imperialism in Southeast Asia, history, historiography, and memory, and the spatial representation of the wars in Vietnam. Randy Rowland is a member and a co-founder of the Seattle chapter of BFP. Established in 2003, um, he was an army medic taking care of the wounded when he turned against the war. In 1968, he refused to train with the M16 at Fort Lewis. He was later convicted of mutiny as part of the Presidio 27. Um, if you haven't seen uh, Sir No Sir, Randy is featured in that film, as are some other members uh, here today. We'll talk more about that later, but in the interim, I'd like us to start uh, with our speakers. Woo! So hello everybody, good morning, um, and welcome to this uh, day-long conference, GI and Veterans Resistance in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, my name is Christoph Giebel, I'm a historian of modern Vietnam uh, with a joint appointment in history and the Jackson School of International Studies and I represent one of the co-organizers and co-sponsors of both the exhibit and the uh, conference today and that is the um, uh, Southeast Asia Center uh, which has a long and very proud history um, at uh, UW and is one of the leading centers in the nation uh, for the study of Southeast Asia. Um, but let me go first and then quickly vanish uh, away because um, really the spotlight should be today on uh, Veterans for Peace Local 92 who have done uh, most of the heavy lifting uh, for, for us to be here. And uh, I just want to say what a wonderful exhibit, uh, uh, our documentary exhibit we have here and what a terrific and uh, truly um, uh, timely occasion today and I want to thank also everybody for the very humane uh, beginning time of this conference when uh, <laughs> caffeine levels have risen to a certain level. Uh, so so that, is, that is very good news. Um, let me begin as usual with a round of thanks and uh, my, my first thanks uh, go to people who are not here today uh, but uh, who are really at the heart of this project. Uh, the Waging Peace in Vietnam uh, exhibit and accompanying a book which I see is, is on sale here as well. And that is uh, the cur curators, authors, researchers, um, and uh, activists, uh, Ron Carver, uh, Dave Cordright, and uh, Barbara Doherty, who, uh, without whose work this was, would really be uh, impossible to imagine. Uh, uh, Veterans for Peace 92, as I said, have been really at the heart of our efforts uh, here. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Michael Wallstrom at the uh, Southeast Asia Center for uh, 
his uh, many uh, contributions to uh, organizing um, this exhibit, for finding a space, for doing all the, the, the nitty-gritty logistical things that uh, oftentimes go uh, unmentioned. Uh, Co-sponsors, uh, apart from the um, Southeast Asia Center and the Jackson School of International Studies here on campus, uh, are also the History Department and the Harry Bridges Center for uh, Labor Studies, who, are, who have an interest in this conference as well, because uh, so much of the GI resistance uh, engaged questions of labor and, and labor rights. Uh, and finally, thanks to the uh, UW Libraries for being our uh, gracious hosts um, uh, in the uh, wonderful space of Allen Library North uh, for the months of October. So, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, this has been a long time coming. Um, uh, I was uh, very lucky to see the exhibit for the first time in Ho Chi Minh City at the War Remnants Museum uh, in March uh, 2018, uh, when it was uh, first exhibited there and has now become actually a permanent exhibit in, in that museum. And I was very taken by it and was determined uh, to eventually bring it to UW once it became clear that it was also uh, would become a traveling exhibit uh, in the United States, particularly focused on, um, on university campuses. And uh, so uh, uh, with uh, Veterans, Peace, um, Veterans for, uh, for Peace uh, 92 and myself uh, in uh, close collaboration, we started uh, sometimes in 2019 uh, to make this work. Uh, and I will uh, spare you the many twists and turns this project uh, underwent. Um, but in particular, I want to, to mention um, uh, Dan Gilman and, and Randy Rowland, uh, who have really been um, uh, companions uh, through this process, um, and of course many others, but I, I, I do want to highlight those two. Uh, Randy, who was prowling campus uh, for months, uh, trying to find appropriate space. Uh, Dan and I were on hunting expeditions as well. Uh, we ran into all kinds of roadblocks. We came very close at the law school uh, to, uh, to, to get a, an appropriate space for this really quite large exhibit. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. Uh, so um, all this was on hold. And then finally, uh, UW Libraries came to the rescue. Uh, again, here not without some hiccups. Um, but uh, here we are, October 2022. And we finally have the exhibit uh, on campus and with that also that focus that allows um, us and especially um, Veterans for Peace 92 to uh, organize this uh, wonderful conference. Um, uh, anybody who has seen the exhibit uh, will, will not leave unaffected. Um, it's, it's photos, uh, it's, uh, it's many documents. Uh, and it's very clear and forthright language uh, that it employs. Um, it is haunting and yet inspiring. Um, it is historically very specific, but also uh, very timely and urgent. Um, no one in, nobody can deny uh, what we encounter here, the courage of convictions, and also the heavy price paid by uh, many of those who were who became active on U.S. bases, in recruitment offices, in stockades, uh, but also in Vietnam, in the field, uh, in uh, Viet in Vietnamese barracks, in outposts, and also there in uh, military jails. Now, Randy will have more to say about all this, um, but let me highlight a few things here, and that is uh, what surprised me. First was the sheer number of resistors that emerge in these documents, in these photos, in these uh, printed uh, documents. Uh, who knew? Or, in other words, what made us forget that there were so many people involved? Um, the second point I want to raise here is just to, to, um, uh, to underscore what a rich trove of uh, GI and veterans newspapers, flyers, posters, underground publications uh, emerge uh, into the light of day. Uh, that is wonderful. It was a true revelation for me um, 
the myriad ways in which um, uh, veterans found um, uh, 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 found venues to uh, make their resistance and their anti-war uh, uh, feelings uh, heard. Uh, the third one that stands out is uh, the sheer uh, amount of raw emotions, right? the mm -hmm. disillusionment, the sense of betrayal, uh, revulsion uh, at the disproportionate violence uh, that uh, veterans were encountering and were made to be part of, the anger, but also the fierce determination to uphold their own ethics. And, uh, the question is why? Um, one way to think about this uh, is uh, to talk about the deep chasm between uh, US narratives of war making in Vietnam and the lived realities of veterans in the field. And I would, uh, would propose here that it came out of uh, the United States narrative post-World War II, a triumphalist narrative of freedom bringing and freedom defending against fascism and uh, communism, um, and uh, how that did not correspond with uh, the situation that American um, uh, uh, members of the military encountered in Vietnam. Here, they encountered a very complex, messy, uh, situation, uh, a war that was deeply rooted in anti-colonialism, sometimes in anti-foreign uh, sentiments, uh, that was at some point a civil war between contending uh, versions and visions of nationalism for Vietnam, but one in which uh, the two contending states uh, that we reduce in our U.S. narratives to South Vietnam and North Vietnam were in fact both committed to the idea and the vision of a united Vietnam, who both laid claim to all of Vietnam, uh, and yet uh, American service members were sent to Vietnam under the pretense that here was a separate country, Vietnam, uh, unified against a northern uh, communist invasion, uh, and that was where um, American forces were fighting, uh, and what, what they were fighting for. Now. Um, the reality was, of course, different. Right? The countryside, especially in, in the southern zone of Vietnam, was seething with anger, with resistance, oftentimes deeply entrenched, not just generated by some North Vietnamese enemy, but deeply entrenched for generations in anti-colonial, anti-foreign resistance. Um, there was no South Vietnam and North Vietnam to speak of. Um, uh, and. Uh, uh, American service members had to confront the question why so much of the violence, so much of their war experience was directed against southern Vietnamese, mostly in the countryside. And that could not be explained by the simplistic tale of a heroic American intervention on behalf of a unified South Vietnamese country uh, against a northern communist aggression. And so these are experiences that um, I would propose were similarly uh, felt by American veterans of the wars against Native Americans and against the Philippine Republic, where the chasm between American pronouncements of, the, of what the nature of war was, uh, uh, con was confronted head on by the realities of war uh, and uh, the massive amount of violence that was meted out against um, indigenous uh, resistance. Um, so the southern zone of Vietnam was a checkerboard of con contentions, of rival armies, of militias, of, uh, 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 of villages that were deeply entrenched in resistance. All of this flew in the face of <coughs> simplistic narratives. And uh, I want to propose that um, and this is one of the main reasons for that sense of betrayal and disillusionment that jumps out of this exhibit. Uh, the other point I want to uh, raise here, and maybe Randy has more to say about that, is, um, uh, and, and that is something that is of particular interest to the Southeast Asia Center as well, 
And that is the linkage between Vietnam and the US provided by these uh, war resistors and their movement uh, that oftentimes uh, brought their uh, raw experiences from Vietnam back to inform the movement in the United States. Uh, this is where leadership was provided, uh, where uh, raw experiences translated into action, where ideas and visions stimulated uh, and brought uh, forth uh, new ways uh, of resisting and organizing. The fierce determination of these people uh, 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 cannot be um, uh, underestimated. And they also brought some kind of gravitas uh, to the anti-war movement because in many ways they were veterans of the war and uh, in some ways, at least you would hope, unassailable in that. Um, as such, they are also a corrective to the deeply entrenched stereotypes of the anti-war movement that started with Richard Nixon and have now become almost commonplace. Uh, I want to remind you of the Ken Burns Linovic documentary from 2017 about the Vietnam War, which I think was a, a failed attempt to uh, document the war. Uh, um, and uh, here, uh, Ken Burns Linovic also in the end fell into that kind of trap of stereotyping the anti-war movement as kind of hippies, uh, left-wingers, uh, unpatriotic, un-American, once running wild, oftentimes uh, gendered in, um, in, uh, in very uh, obvious terms as this kind of uh, hippie women uh, spitting on the uh, 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 returning veterans. Right? So veterans as passive, oftentimes pro-war um, uh, victims of the anti-war movement. One of the great achievements of this exhibit, and I'm sure of this conference today, will be to put this to rest and to show how the anti-war movement was led, invigorated by um, the veterans uh, coming from an anti-war position. Uh, let me just uh, say a word of caution as a historian of Vietnam. Um, oftentimes, and particularly on the right side of politics in the United States, but not only there, um, uh, the, uh, what is highlighted in narratives of the war in Vietnam are U.S. politics, the role of the media, and the anti-war movement. Right? And uh, in, oftentimes, uh, these are highlighted and uh, made prominent to an extent that made Vietnamese people invisible in this narrative. Uh, ultimately, of course, Vietnamese and their agency were the determining factor in the outcome of 1975. They are the most relevant actors in this war um, without uh, an understanding of, of whom we really cannot um, uh, move forward. Nonetheless, the GI and veterans resistance to the war was extremely significant and they actively contributed in raising the costs of US intervention. It hastened the moment where the costs were deemed too high and forced a US withdrawal. That is huge. Let me cycle back to my thanks in the beginning because I do want to highlight once again uh, Veterans for Peace Local 92. Um, their fundraising, their organizing, um, uh, their uh, just involvement in all of the nitty gritty aspects of this exhibit and this uh, conference today is just um, uh, uh, praiseworthy and the exhibit and the conference today would be unthinkable without them. So congrat congratulations to um, Local 92 of uh, VFP. Uh, congratulations to the panelists. Uh, this is your moment, uh, your story to finally be told. Best wishes. So I, if I fall asleep up here, somebody wake me up. <laughs> so my name is Randy Rowland. 
I'm a member of Veterans for Peace Chapter 92. Thank you, Professor. Um, and uh, thank everybody for being here. Thanks to the UW for hosting this thing. Um, what I'm going to do for the next few minutes, I hope, is um, illustrate what um, I think are some of the profound lessons uh, to come out of the Vietnam experience, the experience of my generation. Um, and I'm going to start that uh, by uh, referencing a guy who um, kind of wrote the book on war. And that's this guy named Karl von Clausewitz, who wrote a book called On War. And uh, in it, he has all kinds of things. This book is taught, it's mandatory reading in military academies the world over. And in this book, Clausewitz has a variety of principles of war, one of which is the one I'm going to talk about right now, which is the idea that that ruling class, which best controls its own people, generally wins the war. That ruling class, which best controls its own people, generally rules or wins the war. Now, this is a principle that Clausewitz came up with, and in a sense, that principle in one handy kind of way, uh, explains how come the mightiest army that, that the Earth had, you know, the, all the technology, all the money, all the missiles and bombs and machine guns and chemicals and horror, got their ass kicked in Vietnam. You know, that ruling class, which best controls its own people, says Clausewitz, generally wins the war. Well, the U.S. failed to control its own people, and in fact, it failed to control its own soldiers. And I think that that um, uh, principle, which Clausewitz wrote about in the early 1800s, um, is, um, is a profound moment, that, because what that is, is our secret weapon. You know, that ruling class which best controls its own people. Now, Clausewitz is the only guy that ever thought this stuff up. Um, and so I'm going to turn to a more aspirational version of this same concept, uh, which was, um, uh, came, uh, uh, comes from uh, Bertolt Brecht, who some of you may recognize as a German playwright and poet. If you ever heard uh, the song Mac the Knife, for instance, he wrote the lyrics to that song. Uh, my favorite uh, Nina Simone song, Pirate Jenny, um, it was the, he wrote the lyrics to that song. Um, so Bertolt Brecht, uh, it, was, it was the time of the rise of the Nazis in, in Germany. And a lot of people were asking a pretty serious question, and the question was, how do you stop those who will stop at nothing? And, you know, that's kind of, and that's, that's the real question. How do you stop those who will stop at nothing? And Bertolt Brecht wrote this kind of famous poem. An excerpt, and luckily for you, I'm not going to read the poem because it's kind of long, but there's an excerpt that's quite popular, and the excerpt boils down to this. As long as the tanks need a driver, and as long as the bombers need a pilot, then we can stop those who stop at nothing. And that's exactly, I think, what happened in Vietnam, is that we used the magic formula, you see, uh, and, uh, and it's the soldiers in the United States turned against the war. Um, and, um, and it contributed significantly to bringing that war to a close. So we got Clausewitz, the theoretician, you know, the military guy who was all interested in winning wars, and we got Bertolt Brecht, the poet, who um, was uh, interested in ending wars, both of them coming to the same conclusion. And I think that that sort of is a profound focus for how we're going to approach what's going on today. So, you know, American soldiers got over there. We were told that if we didn't stop them over there, we'd be fighting them in the streets over here. That was kind of the standard line, you know. And that's why we had to go over there and do it over there. But we got over there, we meaning the, the American soldiers, and, um, and uh, found out that the Vietnamese had no intention of coming over here. They weren't going to invade us. In fact, they didn't even have an Air Force and they didn't have a proper Navy. So they didn't even have any way to come over here and invade us. So right off the bat, it was a bunch of bullshit. Um, and then our guys found out that, uh, that what they were actually being asked to do is treat the Vietnamese like Native Americans, where you know, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. 
which was kind of the style of warfare that the United States developed right from its very beginning with the Indian Wars. And, you know, with the exception, I suppose, of the World Wars, where there was, you know, armies fighting armies, generally speaking, has been the way that the United States has waged war. You know, when it went into the Philippines, it was the only good Indian is a dead Indian, except they were Filipinos. When it went into Vietnam, it was the only good Indian is a dead Indian, except it was the Vietnamese. You know, everywhere it's gone, that's the way it's been. And that's not, of course, what people were told, but that's, in fact, the reality. Uh, and it turns out that we were the ones who would stop at nothing. I've got to change pages here, just in case I get lost. So what the empire builders thought was going to be, you know, a cakewalk. You know, they were going to go in and pick the low-hanging fruit from somebody else's tree. But uh, what they didn't count on was that the Vietnamese had just got through kicking the French ass and were in no mood to just let the next bully walk in and take over. And, um, and so, you know, the U.S. went in there, yeah, ha, ha, this is going to be oh so easy, and they were so proud of how strong and mighty they were and everything. And, well, it didn't work out that way. Um, and uh, it turns out that the Vietnamese actually knew more about us than we knew about them. And so um, I'm going to tell you a story now about, uh, I heard this story from a fellow named Joseph Komunyaka who was a, an American Vietnam veteran, an African American fellow, who um, uh, after he came back from uh, Vietnam, uh, you know, went on GI Bill, went back to school and he became a, a professor and a, uh, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet. So Joseph Kumanyaka uh, t uh, told me this story about, <clears throat> he went back to Vietnam some years after the war and he met with General Jeb. And he asked him about the truth of the story I'm about to tell you. And the general confirmed it and actually offered to introduce him to the fellow who was the subject of this story. So it was when the French were occupying Vietnam and the French army was there and typical for colonial armies, a lot of the French army was made up of people from the French colonies because it was their path to citizenship. And mostly what that meant was Africans. Um, and so there was this one fellow who was a Senegalese fellow um, who was uh, in the French army and he got sick of the racism because if you think racism is a uniquely American problem, well, it's not. And, um, and there's lots of racism in the French army. There was, um, <clears throat> you know, if you look at old photographs of the French army from back in the day and it was the African soldiers wearing shorts while the white soldiers were wearing long pants and that kind of stuff. I mean, it was that bad. And <clears throat> Excuse me. So at any rate, so this guy got sick of the racism, or he got sick of being a pawn in the colonial war. I don't know his exact motivation, but he went over the hill. And he took up with a, a Vietnamese woman and was living in a little village and probably was going to live there happily ever after. And in the meantime, the French army met its Dien Bien Phu, and uh, that was the end of the French, right? Um, and so, you know, life is good, but then in comes the American ground pounders and, you know, oh, damn it, you know, we just got rid of those last assholes and here comes the new ones. And, and, uh, and so the Vietnamese government came to this guy and they asked him, they said, well, you know, you were trained in military, you know, arts, and uh, we want you to, um, we want you to uh, participate in repelling the, you know, we want you to defend your new country. And he said, okay. He says, uh, and I've got an idea for you. And then he explained the racism in the French army. And he suggested that, the Ameri that the, the, a tactic that was used against the Americans where the Vietnamese put up signs in the jungles and around places where they knew the American troops would go that said, you know, black GIs, why are you fighting the white man's war and that kind of stuff. And sometimes they would kill the white captives and let the black ones go with the same message. And that, frankly, was quite effective. Um, and it dovetailed quite nicely, of course, with um, what uh, uh, black people back in the, in the States were hearing uh, from Dr. King, for instance, you know, every bomb that drops in Vietnam lands in a ghetto in America, you know, or uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, who was the heavyweight boxing champion of the world who refused induction and who famously said, well, no Vietnamese ever called me the N-word, you know. Um, uh, you know, and so, what was going on back home and what was going and, and a significant tactic that the Vietnamese were using to divide the, the invasionary forces uh, actually turned out to be quite effective. Um, 
and, that, and that gave the Vietnamese kind of a head start on, on the, and so in a sense you could call it the internationalism of resistance, you know, of understanding um, the key thing, which was racism. Not only were the Americans racist towards the Vietnamese, but racism as a legacy, you know, uh, exists in the United States, and the fight against racism um, was so important because, you know, like if you if you believe uh, David Courtright, who wrote kind of the seminal book on GI resistance, uh, he makes a big point about the fact that that the key, the most important factor in terms of of the rebellion of American soldiers in the country in Vietnam really was about the struggle around racism. Um, that, um, that this was the biggest factor. Um, and, you know, it led to a situation where, you know, in the early stages of the war, black soldiers were disproportionately represented by the, um, you know, in the ranks of the, of the ground soldiers, of the people actually out there doing the shooting and the dying. But towards the last parts of the war, um, black soldiers were actually less likely to be the ones with weapons because the brass had gotten so scared of, uh, particularly of the black soldiers, um, that, um, that they literally weren't given them weapons, which of course you can't possibly fight a war when you won't even arm your own soldiers for fear that they might shoot you. And that's exactly, of course, what was going on. There were hundreds, literally, you know, in one year, 71, I think there was 300 and something fraggings. I mean, that's no small deal, you know. Um, and I want to bring, so the army was deteriorating. And it was deteriorating so rapidly that by 71, uh, you know, the Pentagon was even just reeling and scrambling. And, and the deterioration of the military had spread, not only in the field in Vietnam and around there, but all through the United States and into Europe too, where some of the most significant anti-war and anti-army kind of stuff was going on in a, in a, in a theater where the United States was, was uh, you know, facing the Soviets and, and nuclear missiles and, you know, people who could really fight back, so to speak, you know, in terms of their military capabilities. Um, and, and so the, the military all around the world was de de degenerating. And I want to leap forward for a second and give you kind of a thought experiment. If, for those that have been following the January 6th hearings and um, the you know, insurrection that happened uh, at the Capitol, and, and particularly before that, if you were following what Trump was doing when he was trying oh so hard to get the uh, Pentagon to um, be used against the American people, like down in Portland, uh, where you know, when the demonstrations were happening and, and Trump called out the troops. But it turns out, if you stop and think about it for a second, if, I don't know if you followed this, but I did quite closely, um, he didn't call out Pentagon troops. The Pentagon wouldn't play the game. He had to call out mercenaries that were used by the Border Patrol. Um, to, so the people that were down there in Portland with uniforms on, pretending to be American soldiers were in fact mercenaries that had been hired by the Border Patrol because Border Patrol is not co controlled by the Pentagon. The Pentagon generals who, were, who cut their teeth on the shambles of an American army that had fallen apart primarily because of racism but with all kinds of other forces as well, the Pentagon, those guys running the Pentagon are well familiar with what kind of shape the military can be in when it falls apart from in, inside. And so think for a second of what a difference America would be right this second if we didn't have the lingering Vietnam syndrome in the minds of those Pentagon generals who are, I've never said a good thing about the Pentagon, but on the other hand, I, I found myself at a certain point realizing we've got a lot at stake if the Pentagon will stand up to him or not. And they did. They wouldn't play the game and in many, many ways tried to distance themselves and not do, fulfill Trump's wildest fantasies because they knew the deal. So uh, if you think that the Vietnam syndrome is over, it's not. I, I'm quite convinced that the intersection of Black Lives Matter, because when the Black Lives Matter stuff came out and General Miley, or whatever his name is, uh, went across the, you know, for the Bible opportunity where Trump stood there with the Bible, and then immediately realized, because the shit started hitting the fan within the military, um, modern day, all-volunteer military, and people were really nervous that they might get used against their own people. 
And boy, they were falling all over themselves saying, you know, we don't have a problem with renaming those southern ports. You know, and, and besides that, we're really self-critical about how we haven't done enough for black lives. And this and that and the other thing, they were just falling all over themselves trying to convince the troops uh, not to see them, the brass, as a, as a problem. And we, the brass, will take care of this, don't you worry. And they were openly discussing the question of, of uh, Nuremberg and whether or not they should obey uh, orders from Trump. You know, and, and that was going on in the, in the Fort Lewis newspaper that we used to, we were never allowed to distribute a newspaper on Fort Lewis, you can bet on that. But, uh, but there was always one, the Fort Lewis Ranger, that, um, that um, uh, gets on the base every week. And in the pages of the Fort Lewis Ranger in that period were all these articles from the brass talking about, oh yeah, we're for black lives, you know, and all kinds of things like that. So the intersection of, of the Pentagon um, brass who knew what an army looks like in shambles and the uh, black lives protesters and stuff created a situation where Trump was not allowed to, to use the, the military against the American people which I think is a fairly profound and kind of cool uh, moment uh, in history. Well, back then, black per, uh, troops weren't the only ones turning against the war. Uh, you know, the task of the American soldiers was to kill, maim, torture, rape, you know, burn the houses, scatter the crops, shoot the livestock, you know, um, and a lot of soldiers resisted in the field. Others brought that news back home uh, to the American people. Now, um, you might expect that um, a group like Best for Peace, of course, would have a message that says war is hell. And of course we do. You know, uh, uh, um, what else would anti-war soldiers be saying? But besides the fact that war is always uh, soldiers against civilians, that's the nature of war. Not just American war, but any kind of war really is soldiers against civilians. That is the nature of war. So that's the first point. The second point that we learned, though, see, a lot of us anyway, is that the nature of American wars, uh, you know, for profit and land and resources, um, that that's, um, you know, uh, that those are not defensive in nature, and, uh, you know, they're really land grabs or, or resource grabs, and, you know, why is my oil under your ground um, kind of wars, and that, uh, that those are not honorable wars either. It's not just that war is hell. But imperialist war, you know, colonial war, wars of aggression like that, um, or as the student group here says, resist U.S.-led war, like that sign in the back. Um, uh, you know, those are those. That's a different kind of war, um, and a specific kind of war that really extra sucks. It's war for profit, um, and then, um, and but the real lesson that I want you to take away from the exhibit and from our panel discussions and stuff today really is that resistance is possible, resistance is honorable, resistance can be effective, and that movements matter, and that the life of an activist is worth living. My first act of resistance was uh, in the barracks. My buddy got the, uh, the village voice. And one day there was a little ad in there, Individuals Against the Crimes of Silence. And the Individuals Against the Crimes of Silence group, what they were all about was, um, uh, was um, you were supposed to sign the, the little coupon to say that you were against the crime of silence. It's complicity was the concept. You know, uh, you may not be the guy squeezing the trigger, but if you help in some way, or if you just stand aside and don't do something when bad stuff's going on, then you may not be quite as guilty as the guy squeezing the trigger, but you're certainly guilty of something. You know, and, um, and so individuals against the crimes of silence, and they were asking people to sign the coupon and send it in, and I signed the coupon and sent it in, my very first act of resistance. It was uh, not my only act of resistance, um, but it was a start, and I wasn't the only person. I'm going to tell you one more story, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. And this is the story about Ron Ridenour. Some years ago, I went down to... Um, Tulane University because they were having a, the, uh, an anniversary of the My Lai Massacre and they were having a big conference and all the various players, both the military and this, everybody and their cousin that was somehow involved in it was there to talk it all over and what lessons did they learn and stuff. And Ron Ridenour was there and he's the fellow who is a, he was a soldier and one day he was sitting in the canteen in Vietnam drinking a beer and in comes his buddies that he had trained with some time ago but was in a different unit.
And, the, and they came in and they sat down and had a beer and they said, you wouldn't believe what we just did. And then they told him the story about the Milai massacre, you know, and having just done it, you know. And now they came back out of the field and they're sitting there having a beer with their buddy and they're telling you wouldn't believe it, man, we killed the whole village. Well, Ron Ridnar heard the stories and he knew somehow that if he didn't do something about it, then he was guilty too. He wasn't out there that day. That's a different unit. But here's his buddies over beer telling him their war crimes, and he knew in his heart of hearts that he had to get that story out. He had to do something about it. You know, see something, do something. You know, and, and, and that's the question of complicity. So he diligently did, and it took him a long time, and he did the research and got some documentation and, and diligently fought, and eventually the story got out. And the only reason that the whole world knows anything about what happened in My Lai that day in Vietnam is because Ron Rittenauer understood the concept of complicity and, uh, and heard the stories over beer and did something about it. One final thing is that you know, we did not know at that time how effective we were being. And um, in, uh, for a young activist today, I want to say you will never know how effect effective you're going to be. The, the perspective of history, looking back, we can kind of see that. But at the time, we did not know. We kind of felt like we were kicking our ass. We felt like we were making a difference sometimes. Sometimes we kind of threw our hands up in misery because it just seemed like no matter how much we did, it didn't matter. But the truth is, now looking back, we can actually see that there was a significant impact. And I think that... Um, uh, an important lesson for, for activists today is to recognize that you've got to go for it and, you know, take heart, take strength, you know, learn from our efforts and then do even better. The world uh, really needs us. You know, war is always against civilians. U.S. wars are bully wars uh, for gain, not defense. Movements matter. We're not going to go down fighting. We're going to win the peace. And Clausewitz and Bertolt Brecht were right. There is a way to stop those who will stop at nothing. Thank you.